after and all. Okay, let's have a look at another great Natalia Pogononia game. This game is a bit more chaotic actually than the previous game. Uh, very, very uh, uh, sharp, complex uh, opportunities for both sides, but nevertheless a fantastic encounter between Natalia Pogonina and Alexandra Kostaniuk, who both, by the way, are very, uh, very, very high profile in terms of the Russian women uh, super, you know, grandmasters, um, uh, as well as being in the super finals. Uh, you know, they're very, very uh, strong on on Twitter, on Facebook. They're the new face of of Russian, you know, chess, really. Um, with uh, you know attracting lots and lots of followers and great creating great publicity for the game so credit to them both and um in in this uh, russian super final they played actually a variation called the petrov p e t r o v and um petrov's defense um is is sometimes called the russian game actually so it's quite appropriate for them to be playing <laughs> Uh, this variation so very very solid um, according to wiki it was uh, first popularized by Alexander Petrov a Russian chess player of the mid 19th century um, okay it was in recognition of the early investigations by the Russian masters Petrov and Karl Janish that this opening is called the Russian game in some countries so okay so an appropriate opening for the game context and um, entirely a spiced things up actually quite early on uh, it wasn't so dull because um, she injected this, uh, you know, casting on on different sides of the boards, board in this game. After knight takes e5, d6. Okay, she retreated the knight. After knight takes e4, now we have not the uh, normal sort of continuation. Um, quite a popular continuation, but one which gives white voluntarily double pawns. Uh, knight c3 but it gives the opportunity for castling on the queen side so d takes c3 and this might be uh, you know an interesting weapon of choice for those who want to, to play this as white and not face the, the sort of sometimes duller variations of the petrov so um off the bishop e7 uh, the problem is it it's evident already in this position actually in terms of pawn mobility that if you look at all of black's pawns here uh, there's no mobility problems on the queen side. There's a mobility problem here, if if you consider these double pawns. So these guys are all like ready to roll actually, and in terms of mobility here, these guys are ready to roll in theory because there's there's nothing blocking them. But this knight's blocking the f pawn. So in terms of potential pawn mobility, White has kind of compromised the position here, and the scene is set actually for a goal hanging pawn, which is kind of um, although useful as a goal hanger, it's kind of dislocated away from the other pawns, and it it provides continuing stark contrast uh, for both side pawns in this game. That this isolated uh, renegade pawn is is potentially very useful lurking there, and provides uh, the win ultimately in this game. Uh, but the pawn mobility is in stark contrast here, and that's echoed throughout the game. So bishop e3, knight d7. So queen d2, preparing to castle queen side. Knight f6, okay, blocking the f pawn voluntarily, and both sides castle. Now king b1, and now black starts pushing uh, the pawns quite aggressively. So c5. And um, okay, on on f6, the knight also supports d5, so it'll be accompanied uh, like that. And later, it'll be great if it'll be accompanied like this. Uh, but at the moment, uh, b5 is under white's control. So h4, the loner, is going to be a goal hanger, um, the lonely pawn. And look at the black's pawns now after b5 anyway. So even though uh, the bishop is seemingly controlling b5, uh, black would get a very fierce quick attack. So look at black's pawns. They're all like kind of united and, and aggressive. And this carries on being echoed actually in this game, that the loner is going to be a goal hanger on h6 soon after rook b8. Uh, it's difficult to white for white to force open lines, and this is the case. For sometimes you have to be content with a goal hanging pawn, um, because how does white forcibly open the h file here? Uh, 
It's only if black, you know, had played g6 and white could play hg, but that's not going to happen. Black's not going to play g6 here voluntarily. And given it's not going to happen, Natana uses that lonely h pawn as a goal hanger now, h6. So after g6, um, there's a few issues around it. If black in the subsequent course of the game can remove that goal hanger, uh, then that's fine. But in the worst case scenario, the g7 and these dark squares, access to it, you know, has got to be denied, basically. An important part of that access comes later, actually, because these pawns, you know, this is in a mobile pawn structure because of these double pawns here. Uh, but it's tempting for black to try and smash, you know, white's kings to bits uh, later on with b4. But if that comes at a downside of emphasizing the goal hanger pawn, then this is going to be a major issue. This, this pawn might triumph in the face of greater pawn structure mobility from black. Because look at all these three guys. Uh, pretty soon, they're all going to be united uh, there. So knight g5. Knight g5, okay. It eyes f7 and h7. And it also vacates f3. So if white wants to play towards the center, in particular d5, this is the way to do it. Also, I guess f4. But f4 doesn't need to restrain any e5 because there's no e pawn for black. So knight g5 is, is, I think, the main idea is preparation for bishop e2 and bishop f3, as the subsequent um, game continuation shows anyway. But here, black also now, after b5, has the luxury of using the third rank for the rook, rook b6. So the rook can also, in some variations, be potentially dangerous for not just, uh, well, a queen doubling now, say behind b4, but also rook a6. But as I say, b4 might have some repercussions across this diagonal for the goal hanging pawn, which is just lurking there on h6. But in terms of pawn mobility, black's kind of got the greater pawn mobility. It's this double pawn complex as well. It's a bit of a sitting target, it looks quite passive. Uh, so bishop e2 anyway, bishop d7. And so that gives options to black, you know, like queen b8 and then or, or just, you know, even just a5, just, just getting a bit more territory with the pawns. But our bishop f3, and now a bit of a controversial move, actually. I guess uh, black's idea with this move, bishop f5, is to pin c2, which might mean that b4 and b3 later might be more effective. But on f5, it's a bit of a target, target potentially to g4s, and that comes out later, actually, as an issue. But white, first of all, strengthens control of the center with rook he1. Now we have d5, and look at that pawn mobility. White's pieces are like, uh, you know, staring at the center, but uh, with this pawn structure, you know, as I say, this mobility of pawns is very impressive here, this wall here. The Berlin Wall. <laughs> so um, queen e2, now queen d7 was played. So queen e2, what does that do? Well, it means the rook's eyeing d5, and it also means g4 is now supported, because there's a battery to support g4, potentially. And there's a few other things as well. The bishop, if it moves, will be attacking e7, because there's a the battery there is emphasized as well. Okay, so queen d7, supporting b5, also means the rook is now free uh, to move, if needed to b8, or maybe just to e8. Now, this move on engine inspecting this game is, is actually not uh, favoured very much. This bishop retreat, bishop c1, seems a bit passive. Engine recommendation here is actually bishop f4, with an example continuation of rook e8, and now queen d2, where uh, white would stand fine, you know, check, G3, just just because the bishop is is keeping a fight on e5 and the dark squares here, and this apparently is is okay uh, for white this type of position, uh, with the dark squares un, you know being probed by the queen here after the dark square bishop exchange, uh, you know white's got uh, good fighting chances, and even can do, can use actually the c pawn here tactically. This is a computer like move a4. This is actually a computer generated move, because now c4 would would be useful. And in this position, you know, it gets um, quite dangerous uh, for black. Okay, so 
uh, because also there's additionally things like Queen C3 on the cards if black's not careful. Well, the gold hang is uh, really celebrated. Um, but um, okay, or D4, Queen E5. So that gold hanging pawn is lurking in the background here, you know, waiting for opportunities to be generated around it. But this move, Bishop C1, does seem overall quite passive. Uh, so Rook E8, now Queen D2. A little bit passive white's game now rook d6 queen f4 and now rook a6 as so, though you know black's trying to brew an attack here but it's a bit difficult you know black because of this gong here as i say these breaks are not so attractive if if the white queen can somehow get access to d4 then there's going to be an issue so g4 though is actually uh an excellent move but it requires the r the right backing to get its true uh, effectiveness because black's reply is actually technically a major blunder but it's not uh, technically capitalized on by natalia black should have uh should have not played the rook a4 but should have played something like bishop d6 or bishop e6 here um and you know, say bishop d6, then check, queen d2, bishop g4. Black might end up um, slightly better taking off the goal hanger here in this example, that goal hanging pawn. Um, or okay, so so that was um, and bishop d6. Again, you know, that's that's okay for black. But uh, Black played actually uh, what technically is is the first I think major blunder. Um, now the right backing for this g4 move is is not to lose the g pawn uh, under this circumstance of rook a4, and the move the only move to do that I don't know if if I can give you the, this guy's you guys a, a, a quiz here. What would you play here? What do you think the strongest move is? And it goes against intuition actually this move, uh, but there's a very good idea behind it if it was played. Um, if I give you 10 seconds, what would you play here? Okay. You can keep the queen on, on g4 here. You can play uh, this computer move <laughs> suggestion b4. And the idea is, in this variation, after bishop e6, white actually gets a crushing advantage, believe it or not, uh, by taking on e6 and playing g5. Because now, the knight has to go to h5, forced, and now queen g4 is devastating. Uh, it's immediately not apparent why queen g4 would be devastating, but there's a pin now, you see, on e6, which means bishop d5 is on the cards. So say c takes b4, bishop, um, sorry, rook takes e6 is very, very powerful here um, as well, because also now is introducing rook takes g6, winning the queen. Uh, so, so that would be kind of, you know, crushing, as well as bishop takes d5 might also be another uh, strong move here. After c takes b, instead of if bishop f8, okay, protecting e6, then we can use bishop takes d5. So that's why this continuation with b4 is technically uh, an amazing move uh, if it was played here in response to this rook a4, this b4 move here. Uh, but unfortunately, you know, Talia actually played queen g3, and she started to stand um, slightly worse, actually, because black is now take on g4, obviously justifying that rook a4. Okay, this is why we have a struggle here. It's, it's, a, it's a real game struggle. So bishop g4, and the rook comes over, takes on g4, rather cheekily. So queen f3, and the rook comes back to the queen side to so maybe carry on the attack now that g4 has been eliminated. But the pawn that hasn't been eliminated is that goal hanging pawn on h6. So that's still lurking there in the background. Rook e5 uh, seems logical just to double up rooks on the e5, especially against these rooks, which are not so coordinated. So it's not easy uh, to coordinate them as, the, as easy to coordinate the white rooks here. Rook f8, shielding that f7 pawn, meaning... Uh, that uh, the knight might be freer to, to leave f6 if needed. Uh, rook d e1. So what to do about the bishop? 
in this position actually the bishop retreated to d8 after queen e2 okay maybe the black queen's a bit tied down to b5 at the moment with queen e2 but what other direct threats does white have I'm not sure not too many and now the goal hanger pawn is actually threatened at this stage with rook h4 but actually um, it's uh, it's not taken now after f3 um, Alexander I'm not a hundred percent sure okay there's the bishop on on c1 so maybe it's to do with knight e6 in fact if if rook takes h6 here let's add a bit so here could the goal hanger pawn have been taken here I don't think this works because of knight e6 yes knight e6 and white would be slightly better okay so that's why they got it was safe there so f3 b4 but as I say b4 can sometimes come at a major cost if this diagonal is opened up this pawn could be justified so queen f2 on the dark squares hitting c5 rook c4 protecting c5 keeping up the pressure on c3 c takes b4 undoubling the pawns and now b3 and we start to see actually the bishop on c1 might, might not be so passive rerouting on that diagonal that's the ideal diagonal and also look there's a nice like queen's pawn now so black's you know previously very proud row that free pawn row has disintegrated into something um less attractive just just for the sake of trying to get to the white king here so rook c3 queen d4 and the queen is now on an ideal spot on d4 it seems the tables visually have turned here a5 bishop b2 evicting the rook and now it looks starting to be almost very unpleasant for black as if even there might be a tactical combinatory blow uh, to exploit g7 but not yet queen d2 and now actually black plays a very clever move to shut off the bishop and dominate the d-file black plays a liberating move here and if it's not played then I guess the blockader could be swapped as an option with bishop d4 and maybe queen f4 carrying on and then there'll be you know horrible pressure and and black's counterplay would start to be under control but black generates counterplay with this next move by playing d4 sacking a pawn very energetic move for rook now to come to d6 and now there's there's major threats uh, rook to, you know to the to the first rank so the queen uh, has to go back now to protect the first rank so it's a real fighting game but unfortunately on g1 it can it can be attacked again so black's unraveled the pieces again black has an aggressive looking position and we're equal on pawns here so this is a real struggle this game after queen f1 a slight inaccuracy uh, from an engine perspective better apparently was trebling the ropes like alakine gun type strategy to get to d1 as an option but here actually black may be a bit too keen to weaken um you know the dark squares around white's king but without the resources to exploit that is that such a, um an effective weakening this bishop d4 okay so the bishops get exchanged off but we still have the goal hanger pawn and this now is starting to take a major acting role in the game rather than being a side actor after this next move knight e4 because what's happening here as well as the immediate threat of knight f6 winning the queen etc after knight takes e4 um, now what other options were there here it's it's if the knight's left on e4 it looks to be quite tactically useful but actually let's just check this out of interest what was there any other decent options if knight d5 there's actually a tactical blow with rook takes d5 and if queen takes then there's knight f6 if rook takes again knight f6 so knight d5 was out of the question was actually queen e7 possible then nope of course you queen d8 i mean not not taking the rook queen d8 and again white might be better here in this version queen f2 it's it's about equal this is what maybe black should have done queen d8 might be an idea it might be the best move queen d8 but the, the goal hanger is now celebrated after this next move knight takes e4 white starts to be uh, starts to be significantly better because f takes e4 unveils a very very serious threat of queen f6 and mating 
So that guy is becoming very useful now. And even after rook c8, again, um, okay, so here, queen f6 uh, would lead to the execution of the white king because of rook d1 check. And then if king b2, queen d4 check. And if takes queen d1 and queen, you know, mating with rook c2, mating. But white now interferes with black's control of d1. So stuffing black's trump cards, tactical trump cards on the d-file and emphasizing white's trump cards of the g7 square. So rook d5 is the move to do it. And now white's starting to be clearly better. Very, very dangerous threats. Queen c6 guarding f6, attacking c2. And now apparently, technically the best move here uh, to, to consolidate white's advantage is not what was played queen e2, but actually the move c4. So c4 uh, would mean something has to be done about the rook and bc is not possible. E.g. Uh, bc, you just take the rook and c2 is not a major problem because you play king c1 here and the white king's not getting mated uh, to queen c3 because of rook c4. Because uh, now queen a1 check you can just take and th there's no mating attack it's it's safe so technically uh the best move for white to have consolidated the advantage here was c4 uh, white played queen e2 though so the fight's still on queen c3 now queen f2 so hitting again sensitive squares d4 and f6 so what's to be done about the rook rook d8 was played but now rook f1 uh, which encourages actually, well, it's difficult now to defend against these various threats. So black actually plays f5. Okay. Now the white queen here uh, looks to be fairly passive on, on f2 against f5. And black is has got serious threats like rook d2 as well potentially. Um, white takes on d8 and plays queen b6. Uh, which means there's access to the, to the back row. If, if rook d2, there's queen b8 check. That would be quite annoying. Um, so actually, uh, black hasn't got too much time uh, to play around. But also, there's also possibilities of queen e6 with check. So that would also be uh, highly annoying. Uh, so rook e8 was played to at least uh, stop queen e6. So forgetting about rook d2s. In fact, let's check this position as well. Sorry, out of curiosity, I've got to know for my own uh, interest. If rook d2 here, uh, is it about equal? Does white have better? Queen b8 apparently. Check. Okay, apparently rook c1 might be playable. But no, it looks like a perpetual check scenario, really. So rook e8 was played, and now rook d1. So maybe, you know, black, um, what issues are faced here? Why can't black uh, take the pawn on e4 with anything? That might be the first question. Black in the game played queen f3. This is a very, very complex game, actually. But um, let's let's put the kibitzer again, again on. So here, if f takes e4, it looks to be about equal, actually, queen a5. So in the game, black actually played queen f3 here, which allows a seemingly powerful centralizing move, queen d4. So immediately threatening mate again with this pawn, rook e7. And I think this was the, the, the blunder of the game, which led to black's downfall, actually. In this position to defend g7, apparently, the only move, I think, in the position now is queen c3. But still, white me, might be better now. Check, taking on f5. White's going to be better because these pawns are really dangerous fawns now in black position, black side. If white can defend c2 and start harassing um, the king, or, or just collecting pawns on the queen side like this, if it if it's taken, then queen b4 and white will have running past pawns on the queen side. So this is very dangerous and and probably winning for white. So this is starting to be critical anyway, even before this major blunder. But this uh, move here, this rook e7, means now that Natalia's at Alexandra's king now 
uninterrupted after check check the rook and queen are coordinating very well check check swooping in for the kill check check and it's a forced mate here and here Alexandra resigned so a really tense really fighting game uh, with incredibly complex imbalances about pawn mobility goal hanging pawns uh, when to do breakthroughs the flexibility of rooks quality of rooks um, you know attack and defense being combined such a complicated struggle but uh, congr congratulations to Natalia again let's have a quick overview and summary of this game uh, so if you want to risk uh, a massive imbalance in uh, in pawn mobility this is the variation in knight c3 because you're you're accepting double pawns on the queen side and your one attacking pawn uh, might not be opening lines here but instead a long-term goal hanging pawn in the form of a pawn on h6 so it requires um, a more patient strategy uh, actually and you might actually be faced with as this game demonstrates with an onslaught an uninterrupted onslaught of of of, of of three pawns, you know, sh sort of side by side, a, a Berlin a wall type structure. So no, a wall, a wall of pawns here. Um, which, okay, White's asset here. White has to play kind of uh, tread very carefully for the king not to be blasted into smithereens. And um, okay, it was a really uh, fighting game. But the opportunity a White had here was taken but not fully backed up with the best technical implementation g4 was great because now actually this forcing of of knight e6 and g5 if that happened for queen g4 that would have been such a powerful move uh queen g4 after so this rook a4 was the first clear blunder by black but it needs the response b4 here uh, to see the continuation through but after queen g3 black was back in the game fighting game so bishop takes g4 winning an important pawn and after this okay white has easier handling of the rooks for a moment black didn't dare take that pawn because of knight e6 here b4 turned out to be uh, double edged but on the other hand it is stripping open the c file to make c2 more of an exploitable weakness so it's all up and down sort of considerations controversial considerations considerations throughout this game so that c file pressure is it sort of balanced by blacks also got an isolated queen's pawn here as well as the weakening of that diagonal um, but here black plays a super energetic move right at this moment perfect moment to play it d4 it means great coordination now of the rook and queen and potential domination of the d-file uh, but it wasn't followed up here with the best best move here rook d8 just just to seal control of the d-file but instead bishop d4 was played perhaps the bishop could have been usefully left uh, on that diagonal so here again the fight continues uh, but now it starts to flow in white's favor after knight e4 uh, so black is faced with clearer f6 and g7 issues uh, but the technical move here uh, best is c4 uh, but we have queen e2 which still gives you know black a fighting game after queen c3 queen f2 rook d8 pressure on f7 and now black starts to go um, downhill after actually, actually after f5 even even with best play but um after takes takes queen b6 the goal hanging pawn is is lurking in the background here and the variations demonstrate actually uh it's getting quite tricky for black so rookie eight in fact here um to demonstrate that pawn on h6 also queen a5 was possible because of takes check and queen takes e4 demonstrating the usefulness of that pawn here because if rook takes rook f8 uh, but queen a5 wasn't wasn't played um, rook d1 was played after queen f3 queen d4 again g 7s highlighted and now finally white can go in for the kill 
so a mega complex game um yeah <laughs> uh please leave any comment comments or questions on youtube thanks so much